Let's do Welcome it. everyone um, to today's Design in Dialogue. We have um, Adam Silverman today. Uh, it will be a 45 minutes long conversation followed by Q&A. So if you have any questions for Adam, please put them down in the public chat box and we'll go through them during the Q&A. Um, we are also recording this for archive purpose. Um, we are also muting everyone uh, to ensure audio clarity in the background. Um, and let's turn to Glenn Adamson. Thank you very much, Lucy. Good morning, everyone. And uh, good morning to you, Adam. Bright and early out there in Los Angeles. True. I'm tired. <laughs> Thanks for rising early uh, sure. to join us. And you're uh, in your home there, and I understand it's actually raining, despite you being in Los Angeles. Yeah, it's pouring. <laughs> That's um, an unusual occurrence, but hey, misty atmosphere. Lens. Yeah lend something to the occasion. So just to um, echo something that Lucy said, please say hello in the chat box. Let us know where you're zooming in from. <clears throat> and also, if you do have any questions as they occur to you, just put them in the chat box and we'll get back to them at the end. So we'll have 15 minutes for Q&A with Adam. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and jump right into images because we have a lot to show today. And um, Adam, I thought we could start out by talking a little bit about the fact that you started out or at least had early um, involvement in architecture as a mm -hmm. discipline, as well as ceramics, and I wonder what that did for you and, and what its lingering effects for you might be uh, as a maker of objects. Well, yeah, my training, my, my formal education is in architecture, not in ceramics. I did take ceramics classes at, well, starting in middle school, high school, and then all through college, and I went to art school for architecture at RISD, so I did take ceramics classes in an art context, but always as a hobby and as sort of a release from the stress and um, reality of, you know, quote unquote, real art or architecture making. Um, but ceramics was always there, like th literally through my whole life. And when I applied to RISD, I applied with a ceramics portfolio because it was the only art that I had, although I was applying to the architecture program specifically. Um, so it was always sort of in the background and I never took it very seriously in terms of art making. I never studied the history of it. I never studied contemporary ceramics. Um, I didn't pay attention at all to it. I just sort of made it and architecture was the focus and what I took really seriously and what I loved and enjoyed and art sort of, since I was studying at RISD, um, I studied more contemporary and modern art than uh, ceramics per se. So anyway, the architecture in the end, you know, as I sort of faded out, I practiced for about five years full time. That's how I wound up in LA was as an architect. Um, and it slowly sort of faded out and the ceramics became more to the forefront until I made the decision to, you know, pursue it full time, you know, as a, as a career. Um, out of, but the, yes. Out of curiosity, as you made that shift, did you retain the feeling that ceramics was a pleasurable and relatively non-stress, non-stress discipline for you in comparison to architecture? So, I mean, I think what happened is I, I sort of internalized the, the important part of it, you know, unconsciously where the making of it is the thing that still is like one of the biggest joys in my life is going to the studio and sitting at the potter's wheel. So, and people will say to me like, oh, you're so lucky, your life must be so zen. That's not true. I mean, it is a job and I have four children and I have like a proper life to um, maintain in the, in the real world. But there is a kernel of truth to it in that it is, it is incredibly important as a physical, um, you know, uh, I don't want to say spiritual, but physical all encompassing and creative activity um, that I never got from architecture, frankly. And that was one of the reasons that I moved away from architecture because studying architecture and practicing architecture are two very different things, obviously. Um, and I had a sort of early epiphany, you know, four or five years out of school that, and I was, you know, I was practicing primarily in small offices that were kind of service oriented, mostly residential. Um, and, you know, you, you start to realize that you're in kind of, well, not even kind of, you're basically in the service business. Or, or a service business providing a service where when you're in school you're you're you know it's all about you and the art you're making and criticism and you know etc so um, it's a very different reality practicing than studying and I, I came to realize that actually making ceramics felt much more like studying architecture somehow 
Mm. Um, and and so there anyway. So to your to your initial question, I think that there is a lot of um, my DNA, my creative DNA, is rooted in architecture, and and in the most fundamental way, I mean like geometry, the importance of geometry, proportions, um, you know, the expression of the method of the making coming through in the final piece. Like the piece you're looking at right now, that was, I made that in, I, I work in Rhode Island most summers and that was made in Rhode Island and it was fired on its side uh, on top of an abandoned bird's nest that was full of wood ash from, from where I was working. So it left this incredible scar and impression that you wouldn't necessarily know um, unless I told you that, but um, that is, you know, otherwise an ordinarily sort of very pure geometry, an egg with a lip um, that has, you know, I think you can make some architectural um, comparisons in terms of like a tripartite foot base capital. Um, but then the act of just turning it on its side to fire it in the kiln and putting it on some sort of natural thing that leaves this incredible scar um, is is for me, super interesting and powerful and, you know, ab meaningful in the abstract sort of, or abstractly meaningful. You know, it's interesting to think about architecture and ceramics as both having these canonical structural lexicons, like the, you just alluded to the layout of the capital that might occur in a Doric or Ionic or Corinthian order. Right. That, you know, that there's a kind of academicism that's attached to that. Um, but there's also this, um, maybe deeper, more physical way of thinking about it. Uh, the word tectonics occurs to me as, mm -hmm. as one way of talking about the, that, that within architecture, although not so often used in ceramics, but this idea that there's a kind of deep structure that needs to express itself through the shape and through the, even the surface articulation of the object. And I wonder if that's a term that you would respond to, that idea of the tectonic. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think that, um... I, I do, I think that that word is definitely relevant. And I think particularly because I work on the wheel and I'm you know, insistent about working on the wheel, there is an implied geometry and there is that, you know, that, that leads to, like the, the piece you're looking at now, that was at one moment, a perfect cylinder and then a perfect egg. And as it became pushed further and further and punched and pushed, um, it becomes more abstract. But at the base, there's still a perfect circle. It's still sitting on the sort of origin, the geometric origin. And I, and I try often to make the lip still reference or the top still reference the, the geometry that originated. So it started as a ball. Um, and you can imagine if you just had let your eye run straight through from the lip to the bottom, that there is sort of an invisible cylinder um, inside of that, that, that is a ghost of, you know, of the process or the geometry that it, that it originated in. Like and, you know, when I push, I'm sorry, go ahead, Glenn. I was just going to say like a spectral presence of that structural logic and the actual object that you're looking at is sort of um, talking to that presence, that ghostly presence. I mean, I hope so. In my, in my mind, it does. In my mind, the, 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 the fact that there is, that there is still that um, one or two, nods to the to the origin to the geometric origin um, makes it more powerful and clear and gives it a root or a foundation that I think um, ultimately at least to me and I could be you know just completely out of my mind but it makes it somehow more a tectonic than it would be if it was just a free form you know if I rolled out a slab of clay and then folded it on itself and tried to imitate this form um, I might get close, but it would have a very different origin and I think a very different result and a very different feel. And even though you can't really smell it, I often think about, you know, does this smell the way I want it to smell? Meaning is, you know, is the essence of it um, referencing the tectonic and the way that, you know, I think you were using the word. There is also a large anthropomorphic metaphor um, clearly there as well as the tectonic or the architecturally geometrically tectonic mm. like the thing about a vessel having a, a lip and a body and a foot and all that yeah and a shoulder and i mean in this one it's got like one clear shoulder um it's got all i mean i think all of these sort of bumps and blemishes can be 
ca can be anthropomorphic, can also just reference, you know, any sort of wound that you might see in a tree that has a scar or, you know, any, any sort of natural occurrence, even in stones. I'm interested in that uh, rune-like insignia or repair uh, that's made very simply in a way with just these little rolls of clay on the front mm, face yeah. that's um, directed towards us. And I guess there's also something about um, ceramics in the conversation between the tectonic nature of the object and then its surface qualities. And we've seen also, just in a couple of images we've looked at already, the way that you use these veils of glaze that are often achieved through multiple firings. Mm. Either that's not so much the language, but you have this almost ornamental, but also in some ways quite practical stitch-like move that you've made. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you think about surface in relationship to these ideas of structure when making objects. Um, well, I mean, I think that they are um, really integral and, and particularly in this example where the, the piece, when, I'm, when I make pieces like this where I'm really pushing them hard and it's very abusive, they will often fail. You know, they'll, I'll push too far and my fist will just go completely through it and it'll be, you know, I'll just throw it away. Um, there are times when there are small wounds like this one where it just makes sense to try to literally stitch it back together quickly with, with some clay. And what happens is when it fires and gets hot, things will shift. You know, if I left that, if I left that tear un, unmended, the piece may collapse in the kiln because, it, you know, there's not enough surface tension there or structural integrity to keep it. So this is a super practical, but of course it's clearly very ornamental as well. And um, I do it very quickly. I don't really think about it, but it's clearly intentional. It's super contrived in a way. Mm -hmm. um, so in this case, when a pot is this um, physically expressive, I tend to be much quieter on the glazing. Um, and in this case, there is no glaze. This is just a wash. Or this was probably fired a couple of times as well with a wash of iron or a wash of manganese and a wash of red iron or a mix of the two. Mm -hmm. So. Um, and that's just literally water and minerals. There's, there's nothing binding in it. But then um, if we go back to something like this, where you have this cloud-like, because to, to me, um, and I, I've even written a, about the idea of a hyperpot, like the, the idea of an object whose image precedes its form and the way that an object like this one performs quite well, incidentally, on Instagram. And you uh, have this idea that there's a pictorial character that is achieved through the glaze. And particularly this example strikes me as very potent in that way because of the aqueous liquid nature of what's happened on the surface. Mm -hmm. I feel like there's, a, there's maybe more of a sense of opposition between that painterly quality of the object and the tectonic quality of it. And I wonder if you agree with that, that it's like yeah. a tension. Um, yeah, I mean, I do. I think that uh, in this case, this was fired a few times with different glazes, but one, at least one of the firings was layers of glaze and then fired at a single time. Um, and you can see a little bit that in this case, I glazed it on its side. Sometimes I'll put it in its side on a tray and glaze it so you have um, glaze running in the opposite direction. I mean, the pot has a verticality, so the, the, gla the movement of the glaze starts to have more of a horizontal mm. um, impression similar to the finger marks that are typically there from throwing it so yeah i think that there i i would i don't know that i would use the word opposition necessarily i like to imagine that things find their own way of integrating between the surface and the form but um there in this case it really is a separate operation where the form is made i'll usually make like six or eight or ten things and have them there to glaze and then sort of glaze in one swoop of activity over you know a few days so they're they tend to be kind of siblings um or you know a group and um and i'll do a little bit of different moves you know they may, they may have similar glazes but some will be on their side some will be fired upside down or you know try different things so mm -hmm. then you then you start to get the unpredictability of what's going to happen like in this case and then I, I use different kilns but in this case this was fired in an, an electric kiln and for many years, I only had electric kilns. So the question became, how do I introduce unpredictability um, and spontaneity into essentially, you know, a super hot cleanup and, and layer and glazes and multi-firing was one way that I, I started to do that. 
just to give it a, a sense of scale, this is about two feet high, is that right? Probably, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so when you're handling it, it actually has a kind of bulk and a weight, so it's really a, a presence in your hands that you're manipulating. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, most of the work that I make tends to be either a bag of clay, which is 25 pounds, or a half a bag of clay. So mm -hmm. this was probably a half a bag of clay, so it's, it's probably yeah, 18, 20 inches, something like that. Okay. Um, mm. And what do you think about the um, analogy to painting? Because I was struck when you were talking about maneuvering the object, that although that's something some painters do, you occasionally see painters who have drips going in four directions. Right. But um, generally speaking, the kind of three-dimensionality of the way that glaze works on your surfaces strikes me as wholly unique to the discipline of ceramics and something that painting can't or very rarely does. And I wonder what, what do you think about that? Um, well, I think that I like the idea of movement in it. I mean, I, I, I like all of the kind of contrasts of thinking about, you know, this is a material that comes out of the ground. You, you put it into motion. I mean, it goes through a lot of motion. It then gets frozen in time through heat, but that if somehow there is still um, a lot of motion visible in it through the glazing or the marks of the making that are left behind or you know the glazing moving in different directions that feels to me like a way of reactivating the piece or or um celebrating the motion or the process or the life that it went through before it was frozen in time mm. so yeah i i mean i just i like that you can see that i like that you can do it and also you know there's a obviously there's a symmetry Im implied when you throw something on a wheel and i spent many years really trying to make just the perfect bowls and the perfectly symmetrical, elegant, quiet pots, um, many, many years and many hundreds or thousands of, you know, bowls made in the process. And I, I really appreciate that, but I also appreciate um, something that's a little bit more expressive and unique to ceramics, which I think that this is like compared to painting, as you, as you say. And so this is a way of breaking that symmetry while still acknowledging the symmetry, I think, or celebrating it, the symmetry of the origin. You know, one thing that you um, just talked about, which I think is, is super important in your work, is the way that time functions in it. And um, for some reason, it hadn't occurred to me before that uh, one, one way you can contrast ceramics with painting is just by the fact of that freezing that you mentioned, like the, the kiln sort of calls it a day, whereas a painter, in theory, could go back and readdress the surface of their work. And um, we're going to now turn to go a little more, more quickly through images too, but start turning to these installations that you um, have done and are very well known for where you're taking multiple ceramic objects and disposing of them in the space in some way. Uh, starting with this one, which is a collaboration with the architect Nader Tehrani called Boolean Valley. And this strikes me as, um, I don't know if you would agree with this, Adam, but this strikes me as a project that has very much to do with temporality and duration as well as space. Um, I don't know. I'm not sure I understand what you mean. Well, that it has a kind of calendrical quality or a sense that something is happening before your eyes, like a rising and falling. Mm -hmm. you know? So it's true. That is true. And there is, um, so this, this, uh, the two images you just showed were different installations of the same piece. There were basically this piece is, um, cylinder or cone, I'm sorry, cones that I threw the first one and then had 200 of them cast from that. And then each one was cut somewhere along the vertical in the two inch increments. So the ones closest to us now are two inches tall on the bottom, which means it left behind a 22 inch top. And then it sort of goes like that, you know, up the two inch um, vertically. And then they were assembled specifically in response to the gallery that they were in. So we did four white, three museum white box installations and then so at MOCA in LA, San Jose Museum, and the Montalvo Center for the Arts in Silicon Valley, which commissioned it. And then the last one is in the water in um, Dallas in the Nasher Sculpture Center, which you'll see. But yeah, there was, there's an incredible illusion of movement in this thing when you move around it. I mean, this one, this is in MOCA here in LA. And when you stood at one end of it, it gave the illusion that the floor was undulating. Mm. Um, so I don't know if, if, that, if that's what you mean by temporal, but it was a really 
um, strange set of illusions that occurred through these assemblies. I guess what I also think about with regard to time though, Adam, is that it just seems like there's, this is putting it bluntly, but it seems like there's a lot of work in it. <laughs> and even though there's a, they're cast, you feel the sense of um, time's passage in the studio as the object is being generated and then you get this kind of accumulation. So it feels like, you know, a year's worth of ceramic being presented in one go. And I feel right. like there's a tremendous sense of accumulation. Maybe that would be a better word. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, this, this was a really interesting project to work on. It was the first time that I had done something this large and it, and it really, this really was also the first time I had a very successful and, you know, in my mind, um, collaboration with somebody because my practice is really solitary by choice and I, and I really love that way of working. So this never would have existed without Nader and I. We, we did a residency at Montalvo where we just brainstormed, you know, for a few days and then went back to our respective studios and then met again and brainstormed and we were banging our heads against the wall for six months before this sort of emerged and it really became a kind of celebration of both the wheel and computer horsepower um, and you know design like design in an architecture office in the 20 teens where it's just you know unbelievable um, math and computing power to lay these things out and that's why it's called bully and valley it's an allusion to that kind of um, digital calculation yeah to the intersection of two um, different forms so that's at the nasher and this nasher. this really um felt so much more alive being in the water and there were times when i was there when it would be raining and the drops would make circles that would mimic the forms in the water and some of them are just below water um it w that was a really um, fantastic iteration because it gives you another horizon in addition to the 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 plane that the objects are sitting on, there's another one that uh, you can see through transparently and so on. Right, and there's reflectivity, so the forms start to mirror. I mean, it, 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 many things were happening there that were really fantastic. And then since we turned the fountain off, there's a, this is typically a fountain. We, we turned the fountain off and then we raised the bed of it with more of the stone that's down there. Um, there started to become algae and then that left another datum line at the, at the water line. There, when we took the pieces out, there's a yellow permanent stain on there, which actually helps to reinstall it because now you know exactly <laughs> where the water line is. The first time it was really hard. We had to, the, in the white boxes we installed it, we printed out maps on the floor with lines and little dots that we would put down in here. We had to use strings like, you know, building a building. Mm. strings and levels and drop it was great yeah so this lives permanently at the nasher they acquired it for the collection yeah i mean it lives most of the time in their storage room and then it comes out every couple of years and goes back in the water i noticed that the uh pigeon population of dallas seems to enjoy it we see them yes <laughs> a great uh, bath. so um just moving on to the next um project which uh is a solo project rather than a collaboration but again had a very architectural quality to it at Laguna Art Museum? Yeah, so this project was um, an interesting project. The guy who is the director of the museum there came from the Kimball in Fort Worth where I did a project and he invited me once he moved here to do an installation. He, he, there's a series of four galleries and he you know, essentially said, what, what would you like to do or whatever. So I, I wound up doing four different installations in the four different rooms. The first room, which is this one, um, I mean, do we, we don't really need to talk about it. Well, um, you can briefly explain the idea so, of it, maybe that would be the important. So the first room when you walked in showed pots basically, and it was a little bit of a retrospective. Um, there's an, another image that shows, so this wall, when you walked in the first gallery, there was a big wall, this is just a small portion of it, that had these plexiglass boxes floating on the wall. and. I thought that that was a interesting way to show ceramics where it became sort of weightless and floated. And also I tried to highlight if a piece had an interesting foot, I put it up really high so you could actually stand under it and look at the foot. If it had an interesting interior, you could stand over it and look at the inside, which is, which is really um, an unusual way to be able to view ceramics to get that close. I mean, ideally in my mind, you could get closer and touch it, but that's not going to happen in a museum. So this is sort of a workaround, but they also looked, really interesting floating on the wall like that. 
And then across that big wall were those giant, um, you can see them in the background, um, giant top shots of several pots where you, where it really celebrated, again, the sort of origin, the geometry, the circle, and then the circle of the opening and the darkness of the interior, kind of, you know, celebrating the inside and the outside um, mm. and, the, and the difference between the two. The second room was these two um, little rooms that I built out of um, old kiln brick from a company outside of LA that makes sewer pipes. Mm -hmm. And as the company gets smaller and smaller because more people use PVC, they disassemble kilns and they've got just tens of thousands of bricks on pallets piled up and they lent me several thousand bricks to build these cylindrical rooms and within those rooms I made a bunch of pots using some materials from around Laguna and then fired them on the beach in the fire pits where people do barbecuing or have bonfires or whatever so they're just sort of smoke fired um, but one thing that was really nice and then the wood you can see there's no mortar in these they're just it's just gravity but between them there are pieces of wood that I burnt so to make those black datum lines. And then there are shelves that are burnt that come sticking out. So those pots are just sort of assembled within it. But when you walked in there and you stood in there, it smelled like fire, it smelled like smoke. And it, it really was an interesting, um, kind of amazing thing to feel like you were, it felt like you were inside a pot and, you know, with pots and. But also uh, inside the base of a bottle kiln, which is very industrial. Right? Yes, right. So, I mean, there are many, many references and smokestacks and many other things, but. It also served a real architectural and sort of physical experience when you, in the gallery, when you were standing in room number one, or even in the lobby, you looked through room number one and number two had these two cylinders like this, um, compressing this space that then led into number three. And you had no idea that there was an interior. You had, you had to move in and it really choreographed the movement through the galleries in a way where you came in, you were compressed, you sort of wandered around the gallery, you found these openings and only one or two people could stand inside at a time. Um, so it became this kind of intimate um, olfactory and, you know, physical uh, experience, which was, which was, not, I thought, nice. And, and also really talked to the place and, you know, people with the fires on the beach and um, et cetera. And it turned out that there became this big controversy about beach fires right when I was in the middle of making this project, which was <laughs> unfortunately coincidental. Like when I first started burning, it took me about a year to do the whole thing. And in the beginning when I was firing pots on the beach, people would come up and be super curious and interested and say, you know, is that Raku? I did Raku in college and yada, yada. And by the end, people were like, what the fuck are you doing? You can't burn stuff. Are you making money off the beach? What is this? I hate, you know, they got like, I had these surfer guys getting all aggro on me. The good California story, Adam. <laughs> yeah, kind of. And so, then uh, so this is room number three. So this was kind of the work that I was making at the time was moving into larger scale and um, really kind of celebrating the geometrical purity and doing that. I spent several years making basically eggs and spheres, um, clean ones, and then using the surface to express um, something beyond just the form. And the two white ones, the smaller one that's in the foreground and the taller one that's in the background, I started to, you can see those dark spots are actually holes. That's when I first started to kind of break the surface of the pots. And that, I mean, I move in like total baby steps. I mean, I can look back on it now and be like, oh, that was the beginning of something. But it took me, a, that basically started to lead to pushing the forms further, like being willing to break up the purity which led to where I am now, pieces like that black one with the, that are really pushed and the scars. Um, so it took me eight years or whatever it is between this and now to get, or six, seven years, I guess, to get to do you that think other that, piece. That incremental progress uh, that you just described, do you think that's in some ways appropriate to the ceramic medium or is that something imposed by the ceramic medium or do you just think that's your artistic personality or both? Uh, I think it's my artistic personality and me becoming increasingly more comfortable with the material and what it can do and also um, being able to make what I want to make. I, I think I was so um, 
Well, I think one thing that happened was when I started to take ceramics seriously, I basically went back to my roots of architecture and became a hardcore modernist mm -hmm. and was making super, you know, and I'm talking about unconsciously in a way, making really pure, basically modernist ceramics mm -hmm. um, without knowing that there was even such a thing. And as I've moved away from that, um, yeah, I think the medium helps with that, but I also just think that it takes me a long time. I, I'm a slow, I'm, this is, I mean, it's just, a pa I'm on a path. I don't know where it's going, but this is where it has gone, I guess. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were times 10 years ago when I would look at a shelf of work I made and think like, oh my God, I'm so tight. This is, I'm going to, this is going to, I'm going to crack. I'm going to be like a piece of porcelain that cracks if I don't loosen up. And I would sit down consciously and be like, I'm going to make a loose pot. I'm going to throw something loose. And it would look so dumb and contrived and um, not authentic that I would just go back to the tight work. And it just took, it took me 20 years to slowly evolve to this. And I think that's, that's the only way I guess I know how to do it. Mm. Uh, so just to say, this is the last room in the Laguna show, which is uh, video based. Yeah, so that was a, this is a collaboration um, that I did over many, many, many years while I was in college at RISD a bunch, a group of us from RISD went to um, Corbusier's chapel at Ronchamp and we, I, I had done a winter session in Paris and worked for an architect who was one of Corb's lieutenants and he got us access to the church to make this film. So we stayed there for about 10 days and we had 24 hour access. So we were filming in the night and the day and doing time lapse. And this piece we made from that footage, this was not the piece that we, that was intended to be made. This was made for this, for this installation and it's just um, an interior series of shots on the right and exterior on the left and a lot of time lapse and sometimes they're synced and sometimes not but basically just sort of celebrating because in my mind this building is almost like a big pot and it really is the um, it's the I think it's one of the most beautiful buildings and one of the most experiential and also one where you really understand the connection between the interior and the and the exterior mm -hmm. um, and one ex, one is expressing itself on the other and vice versa in a wholly integrated way so the video the videos parallel videos um, just was just sort of celebrating that and and in a way kind of the importance of this building on my life and you know career and work so this theme of um, architecture and ceramics in dialogue with one another, and here we have a couple of images of that project you mentioned in passing at the Kimball, which I'll just show mm -hmm. real quickly. But um, this became very important for you in developing your own uh, exhibitions. Uh, gradually, you started to make um, structural space as a way of displaying the pots in a much more, I would say, assertive way. And mm -hmm. I have occupation, the show you had a couple of years at Friedman Venda is a big breakthrough in that respect. And I wonder if you could talk about, I guess, the ceramics in the show, but also the um, scenario or um, situation that you made for them. Mm. Um, so this is a model of the Friedman Venda space in New York. And the, the installation was, so two, there were two different things happening here. One is, Often leading up to this show, I've done several um, gallery shows where the installation becomes a super important part of the presentation of the work to the extent that I started to think about it as a single piece. That this, if, if the world were to accept this as one piece of art rather than 10 pots installed on something, that would be my dream. Mm. That, that has not happened. It is still you know 10 pots on a something. Um, but for this uh, occupation at Friedman Benda was, was a step in that direction where there was this white piece and a black piece on the opposite sides where you can see. And then in the middle, there were two 20 foot long burnt beams stacked on top of concrete blocks. So the white piece and the black piece were individual, single individual pieces. There's 26 white figures on the white piece and 26 black. 26 references the number of letters in the alphabet and each one is assigned a letter. And then the idea being that I could assemble them kind of in any way, um, almost any way randomly on there and it would create a different um, story or sentence or paragraph. Mm -hmm. the two, there are two larger ones in the middle 
that were meant to more stand on their own as individuals, um, not not in terms of like for sale, but just in terms of within the aesthetic. And those were sort of referring to the I and the A, which in addition to being letters are words. So there's they have a little bit more strength. There are also many references to you know military, school uniforms, um, clergy. I mean, you can go on and on with the kind of uh, references, but. And so, yeah, we built those walls. They're 10 feet by 10 feet and then put a six foot circle in the middle, cut it and then just flipped it down and bolted it there and then assembled those pieces there. Mm. So those, those were, um, those pieces are titled occupation. The title of the show has many references as well, but, um, the idea being of course that I'm occupying the gallery, but many other, uh, that word has a lot of implications. Um, and then the pieces on the beams are individual pieces and they're assembled in a way to, I mean, I, the piece in the middle is more what I was referring to that I've done before in various gallery shows where there's a strong architectural element or statement or whatever that is there to support the ceramics. Um, so this also has, you know, you could say it looks like an assembly line or it looks like a fashion runway or it looks like the high line, which is 30 feet from the gallery and you know, you see it out the window. Um, <clears throat> so, but each one of these pieces is considered as an individual. It's very, I mean, I spend hours there taking pieces on and off and having them in dialogue with one another and leaving some in storage and taking some old ones out. So it looks random, you know, I mean, the hardest thing of course always is making it look like it took no effort. Um, so anyway, so that's, that was the, the idea of this installation. You know, um, despite the evidently serious nature of a lot of what you're talking about and even the title occupation, which gives it a lot of gravitas because it makes you think of the military, as you said, and other associations like that. Um, I can't uh, quite let go of the idea of this project as being game-like, mm. both the tic-tac-toe of the X and O but also the fact that these look like chess pieces in some way. For sure, yeah. Kind of game board quality. Yeah. I wonder whether um, one of the things that's going on in this project is you're trying to, just thinking back to something you said at the beginning of our conversation about ceramics having a kind of sensual pleasure involved and a sort of playfulness, that one thing you were doing here maybe was to balance the seriousness and weight of architecture and the playfulness of ceramics and then have them kind of also move into one another's territories. Yeah, no, I think that that's true. And I mean, in addition to, you know, referencing military, there are many um, happier references that one could, you know, associate with this kind of stuff. And I am also, in addition to the architecture thing, I'm a big dance fan and I see a lot of dance and I have all through, I, I, through college, I mean, starting in high school, I, I saw tons of dance in New York. So I think that this is as much a reference to that world as it is to the architecture world. Um, and the notion that, you know, I, I, anytime I would talk about this with people in the gallery, I would say, you know, you, you could set this up in an entirely different way. This, the stage is here, the players are here, whether it's a game board or a stage or a party or a funeral or, a military march, you can set it up how you want to set it up. There, there are parameters prescribed, but there are, there are a lot that are not. I guess also the cut through of the walls gives it this kind of provisional Gordon Matta Clark kind of quality too. So there's also this sense that even the installation as a whole is contingent mm -hmm. of its solidity and monumentality. Yeah, and also just, you know, in a really dumb way, I mean, everything, I do is I think very simple and you know um, not subtle clearly so just sort of celebrating construction celebrating how that wall was made acknowledging it there's nothing fancy happening there was no attempt at making it a perfect circle or sanding it and cleaning it up you know it was and also not be I mean it basically is the same way that I make the pots you know it's there's a circle it's pretty wonky you get you get what you get <laughs> Master of the wonky circle. I love it. I guess, yeah. So let's wrap up the conversation by talking about a few projects you have underway at the moment. Um, and the first of these is Common Ground, which strikes me as a very poignant project for the present COVID crisis, uh, even though it was conceived before that. Yeah. 
Yeah, so this project is uh, also incredibly um, literal, not subtle. The idea was, and it was, yes, pre, pre-corona situation. It was conceived last fall and, and started in the fall. The idea is to collect clay, wood ash, and water from all 50 states and six U.S. territories. So there's 56 groups of materials. And to blend them together and sort of obliterate the political boundaries um, of statehood and, and um, territorial hood or whatever the word is. And, uh, and then create a body, of, actually two bodies of work that sort of celebrate both the diversity of the country in terms of the materials, the origin, I mean, what's, what's happening below us on the, in the country um, and above, I mean, the trees, the ash is coming from trees. Um, so to sort of celebrate the diversity, you can see from that board that had the different clays and different ashes, how incredibly different they look. Even ash, I mean, you wouldn't imagine that ash would look so different, but it's incredible how beautiful and different it is. But the idea is going to be to mix it all together and sort of um, that, that the combination of it will celebrate each thing as an individual, but also more so the strength and, and who knows if it'll be beautiful or ugly, but um, the, the result will be whatever it is based on combining all of that stuff. And then I'm gonna make 56 cups, plates, and bowls. And on the left, that's just a sketch of different shapes of cups and plates and bowls to think about. So I'm going to make 56 cups, plates, and bowls. And the idea was to have some meals around the country where you had 56 people from very different backgrounds and had a meal together and, you know, maybe figured out some common ground. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was more about the election than COVID. Now, of course, the idea of having a meal with 56 people has become a whole other uh, thing. So you start to think about what, what what does that imply now? Are we going to have a Zoom meal or are we not going to do it? And then the other part of the project is going to be 56 pots. Um, And if you, if you go back to that last slide, you'll see there are in the foreground, there are some eggs with ears. There are, so basically when I was thinking about the, not the cups, plates and bowls, but the objects that they would be some sort of ceremonial abstract pot. Um, And so I did a bunch of studies of, eggs, eggs with feet, eggs with ears, eggs with feet and ears, open forms, eggs that are open on the top. And ultimately I came back to essentially a form that I've been making more or less already, or a version of it, which is the one right behind the eggs that has, it's because I, I thought, you know, and again, a really literal, not, um, not subtle way, <clears throat> having a closed form like an egg even though that implies origin and all sorts of other stuff, it also implies a closed form, not open to listening and celebrating people's differences, et cetera, et cetera. So it became an open form with these ear handles, big, a big strong foot and a wonky scarred body. So these are the 56 or in the process of making the 56 pots, which are now done and waiting for me to, mix all them. I'm still, I'm still getting materials. So I got materials from friends and friends of friends and myself. And then I kind of put out a call, like I need help. Anyone who lives in these States, if you're interested in this project, please contact me. So I've been getting materials from <clears throat> all over the country and I'm, I'm almost done. Um, there are a couple of hard ones. Um, if anyone's listening from <clears throat> Give us a shout, right? <laughs> well, I've got, no, no, this is an old list. I've gotten most of these. The really hard ones are the territories. Like I have someone in Guam now working on it, but the Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico. Um, mm. Anyway, there's some outliers, but I'll get there. So um, one qu- serious question about this project, and I wonder if you would agree with this. Um, I'm very struck by the idea that craft is, in fact, a common ground, at least potentially, in quite a divided country because it's one of the few things that it seems to me like everybody on this huge, you know, political divide, everybody on both sides of it seems like they can get behind at least different versions of it. Mm. And I wonder whether you're thinking here that ceramics is a kind of binding agent and you're trying to tap into something that's deeper than just this project, that there's a kind of, um, you know, potential universal affinity that maybe matches up to the utopian premise of getting everyone together it's more utopian than it used to be before COVID <laughs> did, did yeah. people but this idea of 
gathering uh, difference within commonality. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I like that idea. I don't know. Um, I mean, yes, I, I guess I could agree with that. I would say that this is certainly more pretentious than um, the way you described it, I would say. I mean, the nice thing is like of the people who are gathering materials for me, like I send out this email explaining the project that's fairly simple and it's not opinionated politically or um, taking sides anywhere. So the response I'm getting, people from all, all different kinds of people are sending me stuff. I have a Fox newscaster, I have, you know, the, from the far left to the far right and most people in between. So um, I think that even proposing it as a question is already in a way working. And then yes, I think the fact that it's clay and the materials are very fundamental, people are more responsive than if I said, hey, I wanna make a painting about conflict or whatever, would you send me some pigments? I imagine I'm getting a warmer response because it's clay. I think people, you know, when I, when I was an architect and I told people I was an architect, I, the responses I would get were either, let me tell you my nightmare story about my architect. <laughs> Can I get some free advice on something I'm trying to build? Um, and now when I say I'm a potter, the response is almost universally warm. Like I took ceramics in school, my mom was a potter. Oh, I love, you know, so I think in that sense, the material is doing a lot of the work for me. Um, and whether the craft thing, I think that that's pers people's um, personal leap that they're taking to, because there have been a couple of people where when I send them there, you know, I get an introduction, they're like, yeah, that sounds great. I'd be happy to help. Then I send them my thing and it's just, you know, a tiny bit pretentious sounding and then I don't hear from them again. So <laughs> I don't know. Look, um, I like the idea, Adam, that leaving hierarchies of disciplines aside, that architects get complaints and potters get hugs. That's yeah, a, it's fun. literally. Um, let's talk about this um, incredible set of large scale work that you're now making too. This is another thing that's in progress. Yeah, so this is, a, I guess, another example of the like baby steps and then finally being ready to take the step. I mean, for years, I've been getting incrementally bigger, you know, from like two inches to six inches to 12 inches to 20 inches. And the, the I guess, for lack of a better word, the market in the, in the art world has been asking for bigger stuff forever. And I've just resisted it. I, I've always tried to not like respond to that to the extent that I'm able to and I also just didn't have the interest I didn't have the physical interest it, for whatever reason it just wasn't there um, and in the last year it it just fully clicked and I started making things bigger and bigger and really enjoying it and um, so so now I'm working at a much larger scale and of course the problem is finding a kiln to to fire much larger things, which I don't have at the moment. So I'm having one built right now, although it just got put on hold when the factory closed down because of the situation, but it should be done in the next month or so. And then, um, and then, yeah, things are getting bigger. So it's, and it, it'll be interesting to see, yeah, where it goes, I don't know. Really brings that anthropomorphic reference to the four, doesn't it? Cause it's the same yeah. class that you are. Hmm. Yeah, they are. They're they're basically, you know, I set out, I was like, I'm going to make something that's the kiln I'm having made is seven feet clear on the inside. So I was going to try to make something that was like six feet six. Mm -hmm. And I still haven't managed to make something taller than myself. Somehow I still stall out like just under six feet. <laughs> so I don't know what, what's happening. I'll get yeah. there. That, that might be a conversation for a therapist rather than. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's not, I thought that's what this was. <laughs> <laughs> yes, for the benefit of the Zoom public as well. Um, you know, well, it'll be amazing to see them when they're um, completed because I can imagine that once they have their surfaces on them, they'll be in a kind of conversation with the smaller pieces with which we began. But obviously that amount of real estate is going to create a totally different set of formal possibilities for you. To yeah. Do. So it's going to be really fascinating to see that. Yeah. Um, let's talk now about um, one last project, which is very much, again, located in the future, directed towards the future, which is in conjunction with LACMA, which obviously is having a gigantic uh, rethink and, and uh, recreation um, right. as we speak. So can you tell us a little bit about this? Yeah, so they're, uh, I, I, I mean, if, if you don't know, they're tearing down um, 
two, three of the older buildings, which is the sort of the meat of the campus, and building one new Peter Zumthor um, building to replace them. And so I, I've been given access to the demolition and construction site. So this on the in this image, so most of the materials that I've harvested so far are from the demolition of the existing buildings. On the right, those little squares are um, Zumthor concrete tests for the new building. Mm -hmm. So the idea is to get whatever materials I can, that's bamboo, that's 30, no, it's 50 years. It's, this bamboo was planted when the um, Bruce Goff Japanese pavilion was built, which was, I can't remember the year, in the 60s. Mm -hmm. So they had to cut down some of the bamboo for the construction. Um, so I'm just getting anything that I can either grind that this was a bonsai tree that didn't make transplant from the, outside the Bruce Goff as well. Um, most of the bonsais were transplanted safely, but this one was not healthy. So an architect that cruelty, right? Yeah. I mean, I think it would have died anyway, was, is the point. But, um, but in any case, so I'm going to make a body of work and this is just different floor materials. I'll take, I got some rusty pipes, anything that I can turn into either add to a clay body, but mostly add, make a glaze out of or introduced to the kiln um, in the form of ash. So there was a bunch of wood flooring in that first photograph from different galleries. I'll burn that, turn it into ash, and use that in a glaze and or in the kiln environment. Um, and then once the new construction starts and they start digging, uh, I'll find some clay down in the ground. It, it probably won't be very good, but it'll be usable. There's tar on the site. I don't know if that will do anything, but I'll mess around with it and see. Um, so it it's uh, and then the idea is to make some work that um talks about this moment in la and you know ge the geology below the ground there's fossils there's a lot of fossils there there's a museum next door the la brea tar pits where they have found all kinds of bones of everything imaginable um so the idea is to sort of celebrate from super that you know below ground to the new building and make some objects that somehow reflect that it's also fascinating because we think of uh, ceramics often in an archaeological context and you know in many cases it's the only information that we have about an ancient civilization is whatever they happen to make out of clay and fire because that's the only thing that survives and so the idea of doing this kind of live archaeology of a building that everybody is watching you know, fall before their eyes and then transmuting that into ceramics. It seems quite beautiful and powerful as a way of mm -hmm. drawing the circle of the deep past and the present and the future together. So right. Really an incredible commission. Um, yeah, it's, it's exciting. And it's, I, I mean, I did a version of it at the Kimball, which you showed a couple of images of that installation, um, which, was, which was very different. And it was 10 years ago, um, but I learned a lot from that project that I'm applying to this one. Well, we have some questions, um, Adam, if you don't mind jumping into the Q&A portion of the yeah. conversation. Um, I think the first one is going to be from Christy Ells. Uh, Christy, do we have you with us? Yeah. Oh, Christo Ells, sorry. Hi, Christo, how are you? Yeah, hey, good. Yeah, we can hear you, so go ahead and ask your question. No, I just wanted to ask Adam whether all these vessels are wheel built or, or some hand built, but I think he's answered that earlier in the presentation. Mm, yeah, everything's wheel built. I mean, there's definitely a lot of um, pushing and pulling, you know, after the initial throw, but it's still on the wheel. Everything happens on the wheel. It's amazing. And, and there's kind of medium. What's the, the, the weight of the, of the clay that you use? So the weight? Is that what you said? No, the weight. How, how heavy? Uh, how much clay do you use for so those kind of most of, most of the pots i mean obviously not those huge ones but most of the mm. pots are one bag of clay like those ones with the big feet um like the one the the ones that we saw several of are 25 pounds of clay awesome awesome thanks very much yeah thank you uh you know uh, adam we did have a quick question about where we can see the videos from the laguna beach show is there that's a good question i don't know the answer to that actually um I wonder if it's archived in any way. I mean, the problem is that um, it, it was in a dark room and it was really an experiential thing. And there was a sound component as well. There, we had um, ambient recording from inside Ronchamp that was playing as well as from inside a pot that was in 
mm -hmm. behind the, the viewer. Um, so that obviously would be lost, which is fine. But I, I wonder if on the Laguna website, Laguna Art Museum website, if there's anything, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Okay. Um, we got a question from Rebecca Elliott. Rebecca, are you out there? Um, yes. Hi. Hey. Hi. How are you? Yeah, I feel like you did kind of talk about this in the conversation, but like I was just thinking about vessels as, um, well, vessels and architecture as a vessel and the parallels of that and um, whether, whether uh, Adam has some thoughts on that. I mean, I think, yeah, it's, it's, um, I, I think that it's a very simple and powerful comparison. And I mean, I think that um, they both obviously are, in addition to being, you know, quote unquote vessels, they both have a very strong relationship to the human body. Um, you know, in the case of making a pot, it's super physical. Your hands are occupying it for the entire time of its making. And then it exists, you know, as a vessel for smaller things later. And yeah, I mean, it's particularly like a building like Ronchamp or um, where it really to me feels like just a giant pot. Um, mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I, don't, I guess I don't have anything more enlightening to say than, than it's, it's a good comparison. Corbusier, by the way, did um, somewhat surprisingly to me anyway, um, was very active in positioning ceramics in his buildings also. Mm. He thought of them as one of the key you know, because you think often of Corbusier as being this kind of blank canvas of international style architecture, but far from it, he was very mm. interested in populating buildings with his pots. Uh, hey, Joshua Stein, a great friend and former collaborator of mine. Um, you must be up early too if you're in Los Angeles, but Joshua, do you have a question for you, for, uh, for Adam? Uh, yeah, hi. Um, hey. Hi, Glenn, hi, Adam. Yeah, I mean, I'm also coming at uh, ceramics from an architecture background, and so um, one of the things, maybe one comment, is that the, the recent work seems to really point to some good directions for architecture, maybe conceiving um, of architecture as uh, a way to index supply chains and material provenance, and that may or may not be what your interests are in that recent work, but it, to, for me, it offers something great for architecture. Um, maybe for my question, maybe a little bit different from the thinking about the analogy between architecture and ceramics, I'm maybe more curious if your training as an architect asks you to see the ceramic work with, as a kind of opportunity or the thing which is in front of you versus the thing that it points to in the outside world. And I don't know if you feel that or not. I feel that, but I'm just wondering if that's something that you encounter in your own work. Um, I, I, sorry, I lost a bit in the middle there. Glenn, did you hear the whole thing or was it on my end? That I lost it as well, but okay. So it's a question about scale. Yeah, I was wondering. I think he's Whether or not, um, for me, I feel my tree. Am I frozen again? No, you're back. Hello, I'm back. Um, in training as an architect, I feel like it makes it impossible for me to see an object as only an object. It's always mm -hmm. both an object and something else, whether mm -hmm. or not that's some future iteration of it or something at a different scale. And it's a little bit different from thinking about um, ceramics as a vessel or architecture as a vessel, although obviously that's, that's a very interesting too, but I'm just wondering if you yourself in the same conundrum, let's say. <laughs> so the, the question, I'll just rephrase it because it was breaking up a little bit, but as I understand it, it's that every object in ceramic could also be taken as a model or a prototype or mm -hmm. maquette for something of a larger scale, which is so, an interesting way of reframing that question about the I, Yeah, no, I do, I do, um, I do think that sometimes, and I also disagree with it sometimes because it, it's similar to what I was trying to say earlier, I think where there have been times where I just wanted to, in addition to like, I told that story about trying to loosen up and make a piece that felt looser and it felt super contrived. I've had the same battle with scaling up over the years where I make something and either someone comes into my studio and says, oh, I love that, can you make it four times larger? Or I think I would want to make it larger and it doesn't scale up. It, it either doesn't feel right to make it at that scale or it doesn't look right. And I have had commissions where I have made something specifically for somebody that was a substantially larger version of something I had made. And it 
is a total failure. I mean, they, they're happy with it because it's what they wanted, but it, in my mind, it's a complete failure. So I do think that in ceramics, there is a scale that is appropriate for an object, um, at least for me and when I'm making it, and it doesn't necessarily scale up or down. I have made things where I thought like, this, is, this will be a model for a larger thing, and I'm picturing it larger in its origin or it's in, in its conception, but I, I don't think that's always the case. Mm. Um, let's just take one last question. We actually have a few, but um, I'm just going to go ahead and let Stephen Breckelmans ask a question about tightness because it follows from that conversation. Stephen, are you there? I am, yeah. Can you? And I'm not breaking up, hopefully. Um, Adam, thanks uh, so much for your time and, and Glenn for putting this together. Um, I wanted to ask a, a bit more specifics about that experience of starting tight and trying to achieve that looseness. And I wondered if. Um, I'm interested sort of in that process of, of becoming good at something and, and, and what you learned through that. And I wondered if you found that looseness coincided at all with your material confidence, like as you overcame trying to make it perfect materially, did it start to become easier to make it uh, maybe aesthetically or conceptually looser? Is there a relationship there for you? Yeah, I think that there I, I think that I can look back now, and when I was in the woods there, I, I never would have seen it clearly, but I think I can look back now and understand two things that happened um, concurrently. One was for sure that was sort of mastering the material instead of living in fear of what could happen or might happen. And um, I mean, maybe there's three things. So there's, there's that for sure, becoming more skilled. And since I'm not trained formally, I, I don't have the encyclopedia of technical skills at my fingertips that I can just say, I want to make this, I know how to make this. It was more feeling my way and discovering through failures and, you know, et cetera. Um, so for sure, it was becoming more confident, more skilled, more knowledgeable. Um, the other thing is for the first, let's say five or six years that I was doing this as a profession, I was calling myself a potter and resisting it at, I, I still use the word potter because I work on the potter's wheel and I like the word, but I also consider myself an artist. And for the first five or six years, I did not. I was defiant that I was not an artist. And I would say that, you know, I would say, no, I'm a potter. <clears throat> and I refused to close a pot. I would make pots with the tiniest little hole on top you've ever seen, because in my mind, it was people would say, like, is it an incense holder? And it was like this big. And I was like, no, it's not an incense holder. It's just I'm a potter and I can't close it. So making the decision to close the hole and say I'm an artist, I think allowed me to take a giant breath and relax. And then I think also there's, you know, there's a saying that I've heard many different versions of that everything you make is a form of um, self-portrait or autobiography. And I think it's just where I was in my life and the work needed to be tight because I was tight. And, mm. you know, here I am 20 years later and, I guess I'm a little bit less tight. <laughs> well, uh, makes me think about the late late paintings of Titian and Monet. So that gives us something to look forward to, Adam. Well, that's, <laughs> that's um, just to just to give people uh, a uh, little bit of advance notice about something Adam and I are working on, we're going to be making a virtual collection or virtual museum of black clay. This is an idea that Adam had, and given the current circumstances, we thought it might be interesting to do this on, in a purely virtual way. So we're going to be um, collaborating on that. So, so do keep your eyes open for that. Um, also in the advanced promo heading, uh, I did want to say that Wednesday we have the um, great pleasure and honor of speaking to Alexander Lang, the fantastic architecture critic. Uh, so if you're interested in architecture, either through via ceramics or any other way, definitely come back on Wednesday because she's really the best mind we have right now writing about architecture, in my opinion. Um, and then we have the uh, great curator, Eric Chen, who's currently affiliated with Design Miami, who's going to be calling us from Shanghai on Friday, uh, 12, 12 time zones away. <laughs> um, so come on back on Wednesday and Friday. And Adam, it's been great to talk to you this morning. Thanks so much. Thanks. Thank you for doing it. Yeah, it's been a okay. huge pleasure. And thanks, everyone, for listening. My pleasure.